the, the subtitle that you just heard about felt uncertainty um, refers to some work that I've been doing in uh, computational neuroscience in relation to the, or within the framework of the free energy principle. And I've decided as this conference proceeded that I will rather leave that part of my presentation out. It's implicit, if you'll excuse the pun, um, but I won't be talking directly to, to that subtitle. Um, I'm, I'm basically going to cover three things, or at least I'm going to try to. I want to talk first of all about some um, new ideas about how consciousness is organized in the brain. Then I want to talk about the theoretical implications of those um, ideas for psychoanalysis. And if there's time, I will then go on to talk about some implications for clinical practice. Um, I say if there's time because I'm not at all confident that there will be time to go into the implications for clinical practice. I want rather, I'm going to make a series of points, each one of which builds on the previous point, but each point is worthwhile making in its own right. So even if I don't get to the end, it doesn't matter, I will have conveyed some things to you um, which I think are of, are, are of some use. Um, and I would rather convey them properly than fit in everything and rush too much. So um, my starting point is the common sense view, presumably derived from everyday experience, that consciousness flows in uh, from sen with sensory information. We are conscious of the world around us in the five modalities of our extraceptive perception, and uh, presumably this is where this idea derives from, that consciousness flows in through the senses. Um, whether that's its origin or not doesn't matter. Uh, it gave rise, uh, uh, the same sort of idea was, was built into the British empiricist philosophies which uh, started uh, organizing uh, our conception of how the mind is constituted um, and these ideas were imported into classical functional neuroanatomy in the late 19th century when we began to map these things onto the brain. And the basic idea was that uh, the, the cortex is the organ of consciousness uh, because the cortex is the ultimate destination of the sensory projection systems uh, from our peripheral sense organs and that consciousness is projected onto these uh, what are called projection zones, so that here the retina of the eye are literally projected onto the cortex. Uh, the best known one, uh, this is the one for hearing, but the best one known, best known one is this one, which is called the cortical homunculus, uh, the little person in the head, which is a literal map of your body, um, of your somatosensory receptors in your body, uh, uh, with your, your head and hand and arm and torso and genitals and legs and feet uh, mapped upside down, facing backwards uh, onto the surface of the cortex there. You damage that area, uh, you, you lose somatic sensation. You damage auditory cortex, you lose uh, 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 auditory consciousness. You dam damage visual cortex, you lose visual consciousness. And uh, behind these in the light blue areas, the so-called association cortex um, was thought to, to be where the memory images, the associations, again, derived from the, the old British empiricist philosophy. These were the, 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 the vibrations came into the projection zones, and then they left impressions which became associated with each other. And this became the foundation of our, um, our whole conception uh, of, 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 of consciousness in relation to the brain. Um, everything beneath the cortex was assumed, everything subcortical was assumed to be unconscious. It therefore came as a very big surprise in 1949 when Maruzzi and Magoon uh, discovered uh, entirely uh, by uh, uh, accident that consciousness is in fact generated endogenously from the core of the brain stem over here. These purple structures are um, are generally referred to as the reticular activating system or the extended reticular thalamic activating system. And the word activating is the operant one. These nuclei, these ancient primitive nuclei in the depths of the brain stem, 
activate the cortex, and that is how the cortex becomes conscious. The consciousness does not flow in from the outside. It's generated from within the depths of the brain. The way that Magoon and Maruzzi and everybody else um, dealt with this big surprise was to draw a distinction between the contents and the level of consciousness. And those are the words I have on the screen. The cortex was, from 1949 onwards, considered to be the seat of the contents of consciousness. The, that is to say, the actual representations which constitute our conscious qualia, um, and these are in the form of the raw ingredients of the five sensory modalities that I mentioned earlier. By contrast, what the upper brain stem was said to provide was the activation which activates those contents. Um, and uh, uh, th this was a purely quantitative dimension of consciousness, um, the, the so-called level. So, in a nutshell, uh, the classical conception of, of consciousness uh, uh, in, in association with cortex was salvaged by drawing this distinction. I need to emphasize, I've said it already, but I need to emphasize that the level of consciousness is a purely quantitative, it has no qualities. It's, 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 it's something like the volume control or the power supply. The qualities, uh, the actual stuff of phenomenal experience uh, was still associated with the cortex. All that changed was that we recognized that, that's, that that uh, activation did not come from outside, but rather came from the inside. I think a fairly accurate analogy for how this relationship was conceptualized would be to say something like the cortex is a television set which generates images, uh, and of course the television set has to be plugged into a power source uh, at the wall. But nobody, so the, in that sense, the power source enables the television set to generate images, but nobody would seriously say that actually the, the real thing that the television set does uh, comes from the power source. Uh, the real thing that the television set does is intrinsic to the television set, uh, and the power source merely enables it to do so. Uh, and that word is frequently used in the literature in relation to this distinction between the upper brain stem, the reticular activating system on the one hand, and the cortex on the other. The upper brain stem is said to enable the cortex to generate consciousness. Please note uh, and here, too, I want to emphasize this, that this is a hierarchical relationship. What the cortex does is dependent upon what the upper brain stem does. If the upper brain stem is damaged, the cortex is no longer able to generate consciousness. This is because the consciousness is not something intrinsic to the cortex. It's something that is activated from below by the upper brain stem. And the... Um, the easiest way to demonstrate this point, and I'm going to be demonstrating, rather I should say illustrating, the points that I'm making with reference to a little bit of evidence here, but the evidence is nothing more than illustrative. I'm not by any means going to try to give you an exhaustive account of all the evidence for the point of view that I'm about to describe. But the evidence for the hierarchical, the contingent, dependent relationship of cortical consciousness upon upper brainstem arousal is demonstrated by the fact that a very tiny lesion of the upper brain stem obliterates all consciousness. Um, you can place the lesion more or less anywhere in the reticular activating system, but the smallest lesion required to totally obliterate consciousness, by which I mean to put you into a coma, the smallest lesion required is two cubic millimeters big in the parabrachial nucleus. And this has been reliably uh, demonstrated in three studies now. A two cubic millimeter large lesion in the parabrachial nucleus uh, of the upper brain stem totally obliterates consciousness. By contrast, you can remove large portions of consciousness, what you lose, I mean of cortex, what you lose is certain types of information processing, but sentient being remains. What do I mean by that? Well, the most stark illustration of that point is this condition known as hydranencephaly. Hydranencephaly, not to be confused with hydrocephaly, a hydranencephaly refers to a condition in which the child is born with no cortex, uh, usually due to a massive stroke in utero. The cortex is reabsorbed, and instead of cortex, there's just cerebrospinal fluid. That's what you see here. 
The brain stem is intact, but there's no cortex. Now, children born with this condition are conscious. That is to say, they wake up in the morning and they go to sleep at night. They are also prone to absence seizures, which means they lose consciousness briefly and then regain it. And even their parents can see, uh, now she's gone, now she's back again. So in that quantitative sense, that in, that, in, in, the, in that sense of a level of consciousness or wakefulness, uh, by any uh, normal behavioral criteria that we use to measure consciousness, these children are conscious. But the question goes beyond the mere level. Uh, the, as this photograph shows, as this child's little brother is placed on her chest, she goes, ah, and responds with joy to the placement of the child on her chest. It's a complicated question how it is that she knows that anything has happened. In fact, she doesn't know it. Uh, uh, she unconsciously receives information uh, from the sensory periphery. In this earlier slide that I showed you, I said that uh, sensory information is projected to these cortical zones, but it isn't only projected to those cortical zones. Sensory information is also projected to the brain stem, where it is processed unconsciously. So uh, the, 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 the most important part of the brain stem in this respect is that area over there called the tectum, uh, or the superior colliculi over there. Uh, this part of the brain stem receives information from all the sensory, in fact, except for smell, it receives sensory information and processes it uh, uh, even though you are not aware that you're processing it. And this explains the famous phenomenon of blind sight where cortex, visual cortex is damaged. The person doesn't see anything in the sense of consciously seeing they are blind, uh, but they nevertheless are able to respond appropriately to visual information. That's because the visual information is, 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 is arriving at the tectum. So that's what, are, what occurs in these children. Their tectum is intact. They receive the information unconsciously, and then they respond. But the crucial point is that they respond with, em with appropriate emotionality. In other words, the placement of her little brother on her chest makes her happy, uh, but taking him away makes her irritated, makes her frustrated. She goes, ah, and arches her back. She's, she's cross. If you give her a fright, she gets a fright, etc. So all of the basic emotions are displayed by these children in situationally specific and appropriate ways. So this is the beginning of, 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 and it's not just this child, it's all these children. It's the beginning of the evidence for the view that this is not just a matter of level. The upper brain stem is not just generating a quantity or a volume of wakefulness which is blank. There is a quality to this, there is a content to this type of consciousness. And this content or quality is affective feeling. Um, the, the old view, the classical view, is that the feelings are only registered once they, are, once they activate cortex. Um, and, uh, and in particular, we speak of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, uh, where, where, where this global workspace of working memory, it's only once you label it in cognition, in conscious cognition, that you recognize, I'm having this feeling. Uh, but the evidence of these children suggests that with no cortex at all, they're still having a feeling. Of course, there's some question as to whether the, that, what the quality of their experience is because they can't declare to us what the quality of their experience is because they have no cortex, they therefore cannot speak. But we can look at patients um, with, with focal lesions, and here's a patient of my own with absolutely no prefrontal lobes. In other words, no cortex of the kind um, that is said to be necessary for the labeling, the cognitive declaring uh, of affective feelings. And this patient reports to me that he has a full range of feelings. I, I, I observe him displaying a full range of feelings. And when he appears to be a, a feeling a certain thing, uh, he says that that is what he's feeling. So this is a second line of evidence that the cortical regions that are supposed to be necessary for the generative generation uh, uh, and experience of affective consciousness, in fact, are not responsible, are not necessary uh, for affective consciousness. Patients with frontal damage like this are in fact hyper-emotional. They are extremely emotional. Uh, there's, there's no shortage of affect in them. But it's not only lesion evidence. Uh, here is some functional imaging evidence. So this is a well-known PET study by Damasio uh, in which you see a, 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 a people in various basic emotional states, a state of grief. You see the activation is subcortical, primarily in the brain stem. State of joy, subcortical. State of rage, subcortical. State of fear, subcortical. And if you look at the cortex, it's in fact deactivated for the most part. 
uh, during, these, during these emotional states, during these affectively conscious states. These are people who are able to describe what they're feeling and that's what the imaging shows. So like the lesion evidence, so too the imaging evidence suggests that the affects themselves are generated subcortically. Here's another well-known study of orgasm in, 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 in males. Um, the orgasm, I hope you can see, the activation is in the upper brain, it's in the transition between midbrain and diencephalon. It's not cortical. Um, orgasms are very conscious things. You don't need cortex. In fact, cortex is deactivated when you're having an orgasm. So lesion evidence, functional imaging evidence, there's also deep brain stimulation evidence. I'm not going to read to you what's on the slide. Perhaps you'll have time while I'm talking to read it yourself. This is a study, one among many, of um, what happens when these upper brain stem nuclei, the reticular activating system nuclei, are stimulated by electrodes. Uh, this was an electrode placed accidentally into the substantia nigra, uh, which is responsible for dopamine, and it blocked the transmission of dopamine uh, uh, by, that, by that structure. And the patient who had absolutely no psychiatric history fell into a deep, profound, suicidal depression immediately on the operating table. Um, when the stimulation was switched off, she was slightly manic for a moment and then settled back into her normal state of mind. She agreed to participate in a double-blind uh, series of, of, of uh, placebo and, and, and active trials of stimulating the um, uh, substantia nigra over the next day. And every time the substantia nigra was activated, she fell again into this profound depression. So what all of this shows, and again, remember, I'm only illustrating the point, is that affective consciousness is generated by these upper brainstem structures. They are not merely responsible for volume or for quantity or for level of consciousness. The, 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 the consciousness that is generated by the upper brainstem, it has a quality and a, and, a, and a content of its own, and this quality and content we call affect. Um, in fact, the same point could be made even in relation to psychopharmacological drugs. Many of the best known uh, psychoactive drugs that psychiatrists use uh, act on these very same nuclei. For example, antidepressants uh, act on, the, on, on, on neurons which are sourced in the upper brain stem, uh, in the nucleus locus ceruleus uh, uh, complex, and, uh, the, 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 which, is, which is the source cells for serotonin. So antidepressants, which boost serotonin, are boosting supposedly the level of consciousness. Um, drugs which act on the um, dorsal RAFE nuclei, uh, drugs which act on noradrenaline, uh, which are um, used for treating anxiety, uh, likewise act on the reticular activating system, but in a very different way. Here you're changing not mood in the sense of, of depressive mood, you're changing affect in the sense of anxiety, something which is qualitatively different. Likewise, antipsychotics uh, act on the ventral tegmental area, uh, another um, reticular activating nucleus, which is where the source cells are for dopamine. If you block dopamine, uh, this is what antipsychotics do. If you increase dopamine, you create manic states of mind. So my point is, and this is why I have the word states there, my point is that the upper brain stem generates not a level of consciousness, but rather states of consciousness, and these states are affective. I'll, I'll break off um, the evidence there. Uh, as I said, I'm only illustrating the point uh, that our old conception First of all, that consciousness flows in from the outside is clearly wrong. Consciousness is generated in the upper brainstem endogenously from within the brain. But likewise, our idea that this consciousness which is generated from the core of the brainstem is a mere quantity, a mere level, is also wrong. Uh, this is affective consciousness. And if we remember what I said to you earlier, which is unequivocally the case, that cortical consciousness is contingent upon upper brainstem arousal, this means that extraceptive consciousness, this thing that we take in our common sense view to be what our consciousness consists in, is in fact something which is dependent upon affective consciousness. And it's in this sense that my talk has its title, Consciousness Itself, the actual, the actual stuff that activates consciousness in the brain, the generation of sentient being, uh, is via affect. The upper brainstem the, the enabler of consciousness 
generates affect, which means affect enables consciousness. That's the first and main point that I want to communicate to you um, in this talk. Now, uh, the viewpoint that I've just expressed, um, I told you that Magoon and Maruzzi studies were performed in 1949 and onwards into the early 1950s, uh, and we fudged it with this idea of the level of consciousness. It's only in the 1990s and the early years of this century that it became apparent to us that we'd made a mistake in this respect that consciousness of the upper brainstem type has a qualitative feel. It is, in fact, just that. It is feeling. And this has led to the formulation um, by, perhaps the best known formulation is that of Damasio's, which probably, uh, it's fair to say, dominates the field. But others are of a very similar view. Uh, Jacques Panksepp certainly uh, had a very similar view to the one that I'm going to describe to you now. Damasio's view is that whereas our cortex represents the state of the outside world. Uh, the upper brainstem represents the state of the organism itself. The red structures um, on that slide over there, he calls body monitoring nuclei. Uh, uh, I won't enumerate them, I won't name them, but these structures represent the state of the visceral vegetative autonomic body uh, and are mon not only monitoring it, uh, uh, but also regulating it. Just in the same way as these cortical structures represent the state of the outside world, and indeed a motor cortex acts on the outside world, uh, likewise these upper brainstem structures represent uh, and regulate the, st the internal state of the organism. However, they do not represent the state of the organism in the form of images. They rather are, uh, they represent the state of the organism in the form of measurements uh, of quantities of deviation from homeostatic set points. So there's a great variety um, of homeostatic regulatory mechanisms in the body which basically, not to put too fine a point on it, keep you alive. You have to stay within a certain temperature range, a certain hydration range, certain range of sodium in relation to water, certain range of carbon dioxide in relation to oxygen, etc. There's a certain level of, 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 of glucose and other micronutrients that are absolutely essential for you to stay alive. And these body monitoring nuclei make sure that you stay within those ranges. Um, however, as you all know from your own personal experience, there's only that far that you can go with autonomic regulation. Uh, eventually, you can burn up all the glucose in your adipose tissues. Eventually, you've got to go out into the world and eat. Um, you can, uh, likewise, if you're too hot, you can perspire and you can, your, your breathing and heart rate can change. But at a certain point, you've got to get out of the kitchen. In other words, there's a point up to, uh, beyond which these, these autonomic, um, uh, automatic regulatory processes reach their limits. And that is when the upper brain stem activates these mod body monitoring nuclei, activate these arousal structures, which arouse the forebrain so that you can go out into the world and do what's needed. That's the basic idea of Damasio, that the feelings tell you. F feelings say, I'm moving away from where I need to be, uh, or I'm moving back to where I need to be. Unpleasant feelings, pleasant feelings, in relation to all of these different homeostatic dimensions, are then felt by the organism in the upper brainstem, and that in turn activates the cortex, which you then enables you to feel your way through the world in order to determine, am I meeting my needs or am I not? This is where the arousal of cortex comes from. This is what it's for. I now need to make a, a further point, which is that the cortex in itself is unconscious. I don't mean, uh, I, I, I don't mean that in the sense of coma. I mean that cortex can perform all of its functions without it being conscious. Uh, here's a famous review article, the title of which says it all. You can perceive the world cortically, uh, and you can learn about the world cortically without any awareness that you're doing that. In other words, the intrinsic functions of cortex, they're not inherently conscious. The cortex can do its job without consciousness. This is another big surprise. Here's another review article um, of all the evidence for uh, the point I've just made. Uh, again, the title says it all. The unbearable automaticity of being. The, 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 when I say that cortex can do its job without, co without consciousness, uh, uh, one um, a good illustration of the point that I'm making is that you can flash words to people so briefly that they do not register that they've seen anything at all. In other words, no visual consciousness, uh, no, no, no conscious image um, has appeared uh, to them. 
and yet you're able to demonstrate uh, 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 by virtue of what happens in the next stage of the experiment that they have read those words and understood those words because the words influence their behavior one way or another. You can manipulate behavior by unconsciously presenting words to research participants and words can only be read by cortex. So this is not something that, ha that happens in the tectum. This is not something that happens in, the, in those subcortical structures that I told you about earlier, which process uh, perceptual information unconsciously. Cortex too processes perceptual information and learns from it and uh, 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 influences your behavior accordingly without it necessarily being conscious. And so this is where the view has arisen that I've just said to you, the view of, of, of Demasio's, which is that what consciousness is for, cortex doesn't need consciousness. Cortex can do all of its uh, 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 cognitive gymnastics without consciousness, which raises the question, well, then why is it conscious at all? Which, in fact, touches on the hard problem and, and David Chalmers and all of that, which I'm not going to go into. Um, in fact, well, I will quickly go into it and by saying Chalmers is right. Understanding the mechanism of vision, uh, of, of what the visual cortex, or in, in fact, all perceptual and learning in cortex does, uh, it, 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 understanding the functional mechanism of those processes is not going to explain anything about why it feels like something to be a brain. Why all this information processing uh, doesn't just go on in the dark. Why is there something it is like uh, 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 to be a mental agent? Damasio's view is that why there's something it is like is because you have to feel your, your organismic state in relation to this basic value system which governs all living things, which is that it's good to survive and it's bad not to. Uh, and as I said, there's this, this basic mechanism is homeostatic, uh, that, that there's a settling point where you need to be, and uh, autonomic, automatic, automatized mechanisms can regulate this up to a point, but then you reach a point where there's uncertainty. There isn't a built-in prediction, a built-in uh, uh, algorithm as to how to deal with this situation. You need to now navigate an uncertain, unpredictable, and often novel environment and the way in which you know whether you're meeting your needs or not as you do so is that you have unpleasant feelings uh, when you're moving away from your settling point, which predicts you're going to die. Uh, this is not a minor matter. This is, a matter of, uh, this is an existential crisis. Uh, this is what feelings are for. This is why the organism has to feel like something. It has an inherently qualitative, valuative role of great um, consequence uh, to the subject of, of the body. Pleasurable feelings, by contrast, predict that you're going to make it after all. Carry on doing this. This is good for you. And once you get back into the settling point, and I need to emphasize this point very strongly, once you get back into the range, the, 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 the um, preferred uh, 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 predicted range that the, homeost the particular homeostatic need in question um, uh, dictates, then feeling disappears. You're not busy feeling now, I'm not hungry, I'm not thirsty, I don't need to defecate, I don't need to urinate. All of those things are just not on your radar. It's, it's only when there's a deviation from the settling point that you become aware of the feeling, which then governs your behavior in the way that I've described. This is our understanding of what affect is for. Um, there's not just one homeostat, there are multiple homeostats. There's one homeostat for each affect. And this is why they don't, they, their affects are characterized not only by valence, but also by distinctive qualities. So that thirst feels different from hunger, feels different from sleepiness, uh, uh, and there I'm referring to bodily affects. There are also, of course, emotional affects. Fear feels different from separation distress, feels different from lust, um, uh, uh, feels different from rage. But these emotional affects, and I've put on the screen here seven, which Jacques Panksepp identified as the big ticket emotional affects, they function in the same way. They, same, they too are homeostatic, in the sense that the predicted settling point for fear is that I shall not be in danger uh, of, of harm to life and limb. If you then see somebody coming at you with a knife, that's a deviation from that prediction, and that's an, that causes the unpleasure. The pleasurable feeling says, good, I'm escaping, this is working. Uh, and the feeling tells you whether what you're doing is succeeding or not. That is qualitatively different from rage, uh, where the prediction is, I shall not have frustrating impediments between me and the objects uh, of my need. Uh, and the, the getting rid of those, uh, the, the rageful attack on that, ob the getting rid of the thing that's in your way um, is... Uh, uh, how, uh, how you get back to the settling point. Separation distress is different. 
it predicts my caregiver shall be close to me. If she's not, you have the panicky feeling, and then you go, ah, mama, and you search for her, and in this way, you try to get back to your homeostatic settling point. That's how all these affects work. I need to emphasize the major difference between emotional affects and bodily affects and sensory affects of the kind that I described earlier. The main difference is that it's actually very hard to learn how to meet your emotional needs. It's not hard to learn. In fact, for the most part, you rely upon reflex and instinct as to how to deal with surprises and how to deal with hunger and how to deal with thirst uh, and, and how to deal with pain and so on. But emotional affects, uh, it's quite hard. For example, I've just mentioned um, um, your um, uh, separation distress when your caregiver uh, 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 wanders off. It's quite hard to make your caregiver stay with you all the time and only with you and not do all the other things that she wants to do. So learning from experience as to how do I get my caregiver uh, to stay with me uh, is a very important part of what uh, we call emotional development. It's not enough to just have recourse to these automatized predictions. We have to learn from experience because it's very unpredictable, it's very difficult to learn how to meet these needs, uh, which as I say, they're also homeostatic, but they're much harder uh, uh, to, um, to master. Um, let me just at random mention two more examples, one of rage. I said that the instinctual prediction, when you feel that frustrated, irritated, this thing's in my way, um, the instinctual prediction is that you should attack and annihilate the bastard. But what if the bastard is your father? Uh, or the, your caregiver, your mum, uh, you know, she's enraged you. Your, your one prediction is I want to keep her with me always. Your other prediction is um, that uh, but for, for in relation to rage, I've got to get rid of frustrating impediments. What if they're the same object? Um, so learning from experience how to deal with these situations, the conflicts between the different emotional needs, um, is why these things are so hard. Likewise with lust, you know, there's a very simple sex, uh, uh, sexual instinctual predictions that what you have to do is lordose or thrust uh, and whatnot. Um, you have to rub a certain part of your anatomy in a certain way. This will satisfy your sexual instinct. I don't know if you've had the same experience that I do. It's quite hard to get people to do that with you, especially the ones who you want to do it with you. So you have to, there's a hell of a lot that you don't have built into you that you have to learn from experience um, uh, how to meet those needs. So those are some of the points that I wanted to make uh, to you about how uh, this reconceptualization of consciousness, what implications it has uh, for the neurosciences. But now let me turn to psychoanalysis. And I'm not managing well in terms of time, but as I said, at least I'm making the points I hope clearly. Sigmund Freud uh, distinguished between two aspects of two broad provinces of the mind, uh, which he called the ego and the id. And he defined the ego, uh, as it is up on the screen here, uh, as first and foremost a bodily ego. It's not merely a surface entity, but is itself the projection of a surface. If we wish to find an anatomical analogy for it, we can best identify it with the cortical homunculus of the anatomists, which, sta which stands on its head in the cortex, sticks up its heels, faces backwards, and as we know, has its speech area on the left-hand side. And he goes on to describe that the ego is ultimately derived from bodily sensations, chiefly those springing from the surface of the body. It may thus be regarded as a mental projection of the surface of the body. So this extraceptive external sensory modalities that I spoke of earlier, uh, which project onto the cortex, Freud very directly said, this is the derivation of the ego, this is the origin of the ego. The er ego learns about the external world via the external surface of the body and projects it onto the surface of the mind. And there we have memory traces which represent the external world. And this is what we call the ego, governed by the reality principle. By contrast, the id, Freud says, has a, it's, it is cut off from the external world and has a world of perception of its own. It detects with extraordinary acuteness certain changes in its interior, especially oscillations in the tension of its instinctual needs, and these changes become conscious as feelings in the pleasure-unpleasure series. It's hard to say, to be sure, by what means and with the help of what sensory terminal organs these perceptions come about, but it's an established fact that self-perceptions Kernesthetic feelings and feelings of pleasure and pleasure govern the passage of events in the id with despotic force. The id obeys the inexorable pleasure principle. There's a problem here with this word instinctual needs, which in German is trieber, which is very badly translated as instincts. He says a trieb 
appears to us as a concept on the frontier between the mental and the somatic, as the mental representative of the stimuli originating from within the organism and reaching the mind as a measure of the demand made upon the mind for work in consequence of its connection with the body. I hope you'll agree with me, therefore, that Freud's id and ego correspond to the two basic systems that I spoke to you about earlier. There's an extra-receptive system which receives information from the outside world, ultimately projected onto the cortex, and associative impressions, memory images, ideas, all of this is what Freud calls ego. And the id, which has a world of perception of its own, that world is the interior of the body, not the external sensory organs, the interior of the body which makes demands upon the mind to perform work, and these demands are felt in the pleasure-unpleasure series. Uh, Freud said we don't know what sensory, where the sensory terminal organs for this part of the mind are, uh, and this would make him very happy, but now we do know where they are. They are these body monitoring nuclei that I spoke about earlier, and so we can localize uh, Freud's ego and id, uh, we can localize it uh, within the broad anatomical um, categories uh, that I spoke about earlier. You might think Freud would be very pleased about this. Uh, certainly I'm very pleased about this. We can learn a whole lot of new things about the id uh, by being able to identify those structures. And I, in fact, already have told you a few new things about the id. For example, that there are seven instinctually emotional needs and not two. Um, but what Freud would be very unhappy about is, I hope you can notice, this big contradiction here. According to Freud, the id is unconscious. And the ego is where consciousness comes from. And in fact, it's exactly the other way around. It's the, the, the id is not only conscious, these structures are not only conscious, they are the font of all consciousness. Consciousness is generated in the part of the brain that, Freud, uh, that performs the functions that Freud called id functions. In other words, drives. Drives are felt, uh, but for Freud they were unconscious. Conversely, for Freud, the cortex, where this projection of the surface of the body resides, uh, which Freud said this is where consciousness comes from, uh, it's not only uh, not where consciousness comes from, the processes that, uh, that, that occur in this part of the brain, as I've told you, are intrinsically unconscious and only become conscious when activated from below. In other words, the ego borrows its consciousness from the id. This has major implications for psychoanalysis. I'll mention just one. Uh, the talking cure is predicated upon the idea that we take words which, as you said, uh, uh, Professor Kieran uh, quoted it earlier this morning, we take words which are residues, uh, memory traces of auditory perceptions. They are uh, therefore capable of consciousness because they're cortical and attached to extraception. Uh, we take words uh, and we take the consciousness attached to them in our talking cure and we drag those words down into the id so that we can render the id conscious so that we can know our own uh, internal states. Uh, this cannot possibly be true because consciousness does not reside up here and need to be dragged down there. Consciousness is generated down here and bubbles up uh, there. Uh, and uh, I'll reformulate that in a moment. But I want to say uh, that's one practical implication of what I've told you for psychoanalysis, but there's also theoretical implications galore, not least of them being the major contradiction that Freud said, as I quoted to you earlier, that the id is governed by the pleasure principle. Who ever heard of a pleasure that you don't feel? What's the point of a pleasure that you don't feel? It is, in fact, not, not a pleasure at all. Um, and Freud was very strongly of the view that affective feelings, uh, you, you cannot speak of unconscious feelings, it's an oxymoron. Um, and certainly an unconscious pleasure principle is an oxymoron. And there you see, as I said, a major, major theoretical contradiction inherent in the Freudian model of the mind, um, which is that the id is governed by the pleasure principle and the id is unconscious. Both of these things can't be true. One of them must be wrong. And I'll tell you which one is wrong. The one that's wrong is that the id is unconscious. It's not true, the id is conscious. There's much more I could say about that. Here's a little slide where Freud actually says he borrowed the, his idea about consciousness from cerebral anatomy. I always have that slide because analysts say you can't use neuroscientific evidence to change psychoanalytic theories. The problem is this part of psychoanalytic theory came from neuroscientific evidence in the first place, but that evidence was wrong. Um, they also say, but Freud said that feelings come from inside the organism, and then I always point out to them, yes, but Freud said that the drives themselves are unconscious, um, and here's a slide where Freud says that those drives also come from the cortical layer. Uh, 
that it it's, it's the activa an internal activation of the cortex generates affects, external activation of the cortex generates extra external perceptions. Freud was a corticocentric theorist of his time. 19th century anatomical ideas are at the heart of the psychoanalytic model of the mind, and those ideas are wrong. So this, is, this leads to the next big question, and I'm not sure I'll have time to properly address this question, but the big question becomes, if the id is conscious, then where and what is the unconscious? Because any, every psychoanalyst, I presume, uh, would recognize that certainly unconscious mental states exist. This is a sort of founding observation upon which the whole edifice of psychoanalysis was built, and we all observe this and use this, uh, uh, um, um, this fact uh, 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 reconfirmed by cognitive neuroscience that the vast, uh, the vast amounts of our mental processing that occur unconsciously, so clearly this, does, this is also a part of the mind. When I say that the id is conscious, I'm not saying there's no such thing as the unconscious. What I'm saying is that there are two different things. So when I say that the id uh, is lo located, or the main functions of the id are located in the upper brain stem in those structures that I spoke to you about earlier. Uh, I'm saying that the unconscious is located, broadly speaking, uh, in the subcortical structures, which are responsible for what we call non-declarative long-term memory. We distinguish between short-term memory, which is identical with what Freud called consciousness, and long-term memory, which is what Freud called descriptively unconscious. And long-term memory we divide into a, into a declarative and a non-declarative part, uh, which coincides exactly with what Freud called pre-conscious and unconscious. Declarative long-term memory simply means long-term memories which can be brought into short-term memory. In other words, long-term memories which can be rendered conscious. Non-declarative memories, by contrast, are unconscious, not pre-conscious, because they cannot be brought back into consciousness. That's their defining feature. So when we ask ourselves where, if, if the id is conscious, then where and what is the unconscious? Um, uh, uh, answered neuros, answered um, uh, uh, neuros, cognitive neuros, uh, in terms of cognitive neuroscience, uh, the unconscious is in these long-term memory systems. Uh, that is to say, in the, in the most important ones for our work in psychoanalysis is these emotional uh, non-declarative responses and these procedural uh, non-declarative habits. Um, thanks. Uh, uh, th th that's what I would identify uh, in a very rough and ready way, of course I'm speaking in very broad brushstrokes here, uh, with what we call the unconscious. So I say again, I'm not saying that there is not an unconscious, uh, 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 when I say that the id is conscious, I'm saying that Freud conflated id functions with the unconscious and they're not in fact one and the same thing and we make great theoretical strides if we separate these two things from each other. Now, um, I haven't time to go into all the old basic story about how this works, but the major point is short-term memory, short-term cognitive consciousness is a very limited resource. Um, we, there's very little information you can hold in there. You therefore have to constantly shunt it into long-term memory, and that's a process called consolidation, synaptic consolidation, into episodic memory where you have concrete images which you can replay in your cortex. Um, uh, uh, thanks, to the, thanks to the hippocampus. And then this gets consolidated in the way um, that uh, Richard Lane was talking about into semantic memory when it becomes general, generalized abstract facts about the world. And then that in turn gets, gets uh, consolidated into non-declarative memory and eventually these things become automatized habits. I've put it very simply, it doesn't only happen in series, consolidation also happens in parallel. There, there is information that goes directly into the non-declarative systems. But this is where we need to look if we want to understand uh, from a neuroscientific point of view uh, what the unconscious is. The problem um, ar arises from the fact that cognitive neuroscientists tell us that this unconscious is nothing like the Freudian unconscious. This is where we automatize all of our solutions to life's problems. It's therefore a very wholesome place, whereas the Freudian unconscious is a troublesome beast full of problems and conflicts uh, and in fact something that we're trying to get rid of uh, the better way, uh, th these, these, these uh, highly maladaptive things. And so the Freudian unconscious and, and the cognitive unconscious are supposed to be incompatible with each other. Probably it'll be the second last point that I have time to make. I don't buy that, I don't believe that, I don't think it's true. Everyday observation shows us that these very same, these very same structures can be used to automatize highly maladaptive responses. Uh, like, for example, uh, addictions. Uh, 
uh, with the, they make use of exactly those systems. The, it's not good for us to smoke, but uh, some of you might have noticed every now and then I go outside and I smoke. Why? Because I just automatically, habitually, um, addictively uh, want to do that, even though it's not good for me, and it's very clear which structures are responsible for that. Likewise, post-traumatic stress disorder, again, you heard from Richard Lane about that. You know, things, shit happens. And then you have automatized responses, and you can do nothing about them. Even though they're not nice, um, these systems can be recruited by... What if you, in early life, um, in, your, in, your, uh, in your, um, um, the, the process of attaching to caregivers, what if your choices are between a rock and a hard place? You know, you have to choose either a rock or a hard place. So you attach to a hard place, that then becomes automatized. So all of these things do become automatized. It's self-evidently true that the cognitive unconscious is not only full of nice, wholesome things. The mechanism is that you must automatize these things. Consciousness is very limited resource. You want to automatize solutions so that these can be automatically, quickly, uh, and in a, very, in a highly generalizable way, uh, uh, automatically enacted rather than the slow, ponderous, conscious thought process, which is only required when you have a, when you have a problem that you don't have a solution to. As soon as you've found a solution, you consolidate it. This is how it should work, but it isn't how it always works for the reasons that I've said. Uh, especially in early childhood, there are an enormous number of insoluble problems. Children are dependent, they're feeble, they're ignorant of the ways of the world. They have the same needs that you and I have, but they can't possibly meet them. So they have two choices. Either they use their little bit of short-term memory to think, 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 their way through problems which they can never solve, or they automatize their, their silly childish solutions, the best ones that they could come up with, so as to free up short-term memory for problems that they can solve. So rather than thinking, you know, I'm, I'm three or four-year-old Mark Solms, I really want to make babies, I don't know, how do I make babies? Let me think, think, think. No, I want to be one of the big parents who bosses others around. I don't want to be bossed around by them. Let me think, 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 how do I solve that? I want to make babies with her. How do I do that? Shit, she seems to be with him. How do I get rid of him? Let me think, think, think. These are problems that you can never think your way through. So you automatize your childish solutions, your, the, 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 the least bad solutions that you can come up with to free up uh, your mind, to not be overwhelmed by these problems. And that is what we call repression. Repression is simply those automatized predictions as to how to meet your needs, which are illegitimately automatized. They, they're automatized even though they do not fit the bill. Um, I've run out of time, so I will just end with this slide, which summarizes, well, it's my second last slide, which summarizes what I've just said. The id is conscious, that is to say we're conscious of our needs. The task of the ego is to learn how to resolve those needs so that we can become unconscious of our predictions, so that we can automatize them. The ego aspires to zombiedom. Uh, and I think that as surprising as that sounds, that's the sort of basic design of the mind. The consciousness comes from the id, and the ego is trying to resolve the consciousness, trying to learn how to meet those needs so that you know exactly what to do automatically and immediately, which is, of course, a task that is never actually fulfilled. Had I time, I would have talked about these things, about the implications for our clinical technique, but I don't have time, but I've covered at least some of the main points. Thanks very much.